I am Jim Collison, and this is Gallup's Called to Coach, recorded on January 19th, 2022. Call the Coach is a resource for those who want to help others discover and use their strengths. We have Gallup experts and independent strengths coaches share tactics, insights, and strategies to help coaches maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. If you're listening live, love to have you join us in our chat room. There's a link right above me there. Click on that. I'll take you to YouTube. Sign into the chat room. Ask your questions live. If you have questions after the fact, or maybe you're listening to this on YouTube or as a podcast, you can send us an email coaching at gallup.com and of course don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app to this called the coach right there on youtube subscribe button over in the bottom right hand corner brent o'bannon is my guest today brent is a gallup certified coach and icf master certified coach who's facilitated twenty seven thousand coaching sessions that's a lot of coaching sessions brent spoken to 500 plus organizations become an amazon number one best-selling author and is a global Strengthspreneur and strengths champion as the first Gallup certified coach under our current program. Uh, he does have that number one uh, designation. Brent's top five is focus, individualization, achiever, command, competition, and woo. Coming to us from the great state of Texas, Brent O'Bannon. Welcome to Call the Coach. Jim Collison, it's, it never gets old hearing you uh, do this intro to your podcast. Well, thanks. Good, good to have you. You and I have been doing this a long time. Uh, you were one of the first. Uh, when we say first certified coaches in our current program, also one of the first coaches we interviewed on called the coach before it was even called the coach. I think we did a call with you. We did it on uh, ready talk or one of those kind of crazy programs. And that might've been the Genesis for me meeting with that team to say, you know, we could do this just a little Mac, you know, maximizer number three, we could do this just a little bit better with audio and video. So Thanks for saying yes to all those things, and say, thanks for saying uh, yes today, uh, and welcome. Hey, I want to start a little bit uh, about the, the state of the coaching world. You've been doing this a lot. How long have you been? It, when you think about as, as being a coach or a coach of coaches, how long have you been doing this, Brent? Started my business 1993 as a professional counselor in private practice, and then I repurposed into a professional coach about 12 years ago. And give us, let's talk a little bit about the state of the coaching world today in 2022. I mean, there's been a few small events that have affected maybe what's gone on around the world. And I think has, has really shaken the world. I mean, just from in, in some cases has made it better. It's made it, people are more open for coaching. People are more open for development. But if I were to ask you, you know, wh where, where do you think the state of the coaching world is today? Give us, give us your you know, kind of your, your background, your synopsis on it? Probably some pros and cons. And uh, I'll start with the pros because we're strengths-based coaches. And number one is uh, there is a greater awareness about what coaching is and what it's not. It's not therapy. It's not consulting. And so people are being better educated in today's world about what coaching can uh, benefit you. The, the second pro that I see is that more professional coaches are taking it not as a hobby, but as a profession. And so that means they're getting more International Coach Federation training and they're taking their coaching skills to a whole nother level. And I'll say the third pro about the coaching movement is that there is more opportunity to work in the corporate world. So not only with entrepreneurs and small business owners, but in the corporate world. Now, a couple of cons, I would say that number one, the coaching field is getting more and more saturated. And so absolutely, you have to figure out as a coach, how are you going to differentiate in the sea of coaches? How are you going to stand out? And that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. So I would say that's uh, three pros and one con. Do you think it's too late for coaches? If, if I was thinking, you know, you know, I'd like to kind of start my own business and, and maybe be a coach for, for individuals, for corporations. 
you know, we have 11,000 plus certified coaches uh, out there. Plus, you know, thinking the coaching world, is it too late Brent for me to jump in the pool at this point? Never too late. No, there, no, the, the coaching industry is still a billion dollar industry. And so the opportunity is still better than ever. And whatever, you know, work that someone has to have a side hustle, whether you're a consultant, coach, uh, facilitator, trainer, teacher, whatever you call yourself, you're going to deliver services and make a difference in the world. You're going to design your life and business and be in the flow of your strengths, your purpose. And so that opportunity, it's never too late. But I will say it's going to take being able to play the long game. You've got to have resilience and you've got to have self-compassion. You have to be able to, to overcome that imposter syndrome if you're going to stay in the long game building your business as a coach. Brent, you say the long game and you know I know you can't give an exact number, but as we think about, you're, you're a coach of coaches and you've seen this cycle over and over. If you were to think about someone starting in starting their own business, becoming a, a certified coach and doing the work that they do to a point of stability, generally, how long does that take and, and what should folks expect in, in that phase? Yeah, I mean, it, it took me three years to really develop uh, my coaching business to the point that it was really solid and I think people can speed that process up with having their own professional coach as well as their own mastermind mm. and doing more training. So I think they can speed it up to a, a year, a year and a half. I mean, I can think of one of my uh, coaching clients who, you know, she was teaching in a university setting and she was making about 60000 a year. And she went to my coach business builder strengthspreneur program and she got one contract during that three month program and she got 60 K in that contract. So she literally doubled her income and that was just in the first three months. Mm -hmm. So if you follow entrepreneurial excellence and business building, then the sky is the limit. You, we, we had talked about this idea of differentiating yourself as a coach and in the business world. I mean, the coaching aspect of it, everybody for our Gallup certified strengths coaches, they all go through the same training. They all get the same materials. They all have the same opportunity, right? They've, they, they've been through this consistency of training and learning. But when we think about differentiating yourself in, in kind of, creating that specialized or that content that you need to begin to push forward. Can you talk a little bit about that? Cause I think that's really the first step in setting yourself up as a coach and doing w what you're doing in your own business. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I, I think becoming a thought leader is really how we differentiate ourselves. If you think about it, you know, uh, one of my heroes is Jack Canfield. And so he not only started the Chicken Soup for the Soul series book, that's what he became famous for. And then he, he eventually sold it and made uh, multi-million dollars, but also his book, The Success Principle. So he's known for that content. You know, when you think of Simon Sinek, you think about starting with why. When you think of Brene Brown, you think of confident vulnerability. When you think of Gino Wickman, you think of EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System. So coaches who are trained by Gallup or any other organization, we, we have to be careful not just to regurgitate everything we've been taught. You have your own wisdom. You have your own experiences. You even have your own flossomeness. So that means hold, hold that- Hold on. What, yeah. What is that? <laughs> okay. So flossom is a real word. And, and flossom means that you are still awesome with your flaws. Mm. And so we all have our own flossomeness. And so that means you actually embrace not only the superpower, super uniqueness of your strengths, but as we all know, with every corresponding strength, there is a weakness and downside. 
And so really you cannot escape both. And so you can actually build your business. Now get this is a little controversial, not just around your strengths, but around your weaknesses, Mm. because that is what differentiates and causes you to be standing out as a thought leader. I, it's okay. So I think there's some, you said low controversy and I think some people will be saying no way. Can you give a, maybe a personal example from you, like in this area of, of flossomeness, what, what do you, what are you not doing well? And, but how are you taking advantage of that at the same time? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. For an example, uh, you know, I'm bold and with my particular strengths with command and competition and achiever focus, I, I, I'm a bold communicator. And so I've been dinged before. I've been tapped on the shoulder like, Brent, I think you might be going overboard a little bit here. You might be tooting your own horn. You might be marketing too aggressively. And at the same time, that's part of my genius is that I'm going to be bold. I'm going to market and I'm going to speak out. And some people are going to love it. And some people will resist it. And that's okay. And that's true, not just for me, that's true for every one of us. How do you handle the, you know, for those that become a little disjointed with that, that always happens in in the world I live in. I hear from those individuals, I get that feedback and, and, you know, you gotta, you gotta kind of take it in, accept it for what it is. But how do you, how do you deal with those naysayers, so to speak, or those folks that you might grind the wrong way based on that? So this is where self-compassion comes in. And if, if you haven't ever jumped into the research by Kristen Neff, and so she's an example of, of a thought leader. She's taken that whole area of self-compassion and now she is known as the, the thought leader. But here, here are a couple of questions on her assessment. I'm disapproving and judgmental about my own flaws and inadequacies. When I fail at something important to me, I become consumed by feelings of inadequacy. I'm intolerant and impatient towards those aspects of my personality I don't like. So these are examples of questions that we're going to fail. Uh, we're not going to be liked by everyone. And so the question is, how much grace, how much compassion, how much emotional intelligence can you have around these areas? Because you're going to need these mm-hmm. in order uh, to survive. One, one quick thing, um, you know, I'll never forget. And I was reading through the the Old Testament in the Bible and you know, King David was uh, being, uh, he had enemies that were seeking to kill him and uh, put him away, so to speak. And I remember this one verse that said, David encouraged himself in the Lord. And so that that's an example of like self-compassion, self-encouragement. And we all have to find ways. How do you, how do you boost your resilience? You know, so you don't, give up. Yeah. As you're, as you're working with other coaches and those difficult times always come in different forms for people. Mm-hmm. How do you, do you have any advice or how, when we think of this idea of resiliency or resilience, mm-hmm. how do we, do you have any tips to help coaches? Like what can they, when they're in those down moments, right? When they're in those moments where they're beating themselves up or they're getting beat up, it happens both ways. What kind of advice do you give them or is there any kind of universal principles you could bring to that, that to say, try this? You know, for me, it's so tempting to isolate and, you know, be too independent whenever I get discouraged and I have individualization. I have relator as my two relationship building strengths in my top 10 And so that means I have to have my own professional coach. I have to have my own business mastermind. I have to have my own uh, spiritual tribe uh, to be able to get that encouragement. That's number one for me. And I I believe that's true for a lot of people. We, We get too independent and we don't really connect at a deeper level. It's a superficial level. 
You know, we watch podcasts, we read articles, but are you actually having deep conversation? Are you really, you know, allowing someone to ask you deep questions so that you can, um, you know, learn more about yourself? So I think that's number one. Number two is, you know, many of you who are learners, you're great at this learner and input. You are constantly uh, sharpening the saw and you're constantly taking new courses. And that's one way, even though I don't have high learner, my focus and achiever do a lot of learning for me. So getting new certifications, taking new courses, uh, reading articles, listening to Audible. Man, I, I think, you know, 52 books is what I went through this past year on Audible. So those are just a couple of ideas mm. of how to stay resilient. A couple of years ago, we spent a whole year talking about how everybody needs a coach and mm -hmm. even coaches need coaches. I'll admit, I have a friend who acts as that outside consultant for me, not a part of my world at all. Mm -hmm. He's a good friend, but not invested in anything I do at work. He's not a certified strengths coach. He's not like he allows me to be that coach where I can kind of say, hey, here's how I'm feeling. And he can give me this incredible feedback. I just had a conversation with them just a couple days ago. Um, very, I think very, very helpful, Brent. The second question I get asked, how do I find somebody like that? Now you do that, but for, let's, you know, for general standpoint, as we have these coaches listening, how do they find a, a coach to coach them on coaching? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but number one, I Google. And so <laughs> if, if, someone doesn't have an online presence or credibility and I can't find them, then I probably don't trust quite as high personally. And number two, I start looking for, you know, who are the people they've worked with? What are some of their case studies and examples of successes that they've had? And so if I can look at, oh, yeah, that person grew their business, that person wrote their first book, uh, that person, you know, stood out as a thought leader, you know, then that makes me want to reach out to them. So, you know, there's lots of coaching directories out there. But again, I don't see those as typically great ways to find coaches, uh, you know research someone mm -hmm. and connect with them on LinkedIn and then set up that, you know, ask Brent anything call or that get acquainted call and see if you resonate, see if you connect. Mm -hmm. Well, and you, you often, we often talk about mastermind groups where you can have reciprocal coaching relationships with, with folks. I, I oftentimes say connect with someone who's your opposite. <laughs> like don't, don't mm. find someone who's just like you. I mean, that's yes. fun. That's fun. But find somebody who's your opposite because I think that yin and yang concept of being able to them seeing things through a different light, even mm -hmm. a different political or a different socioeconomical mm -hmm. or a different like whatever, right? Even maybe across countries. I always find mm -hmm. one of the privileges that I get is I get to talk about this, you know, this these, these Clifton strengths concepts around the world. And so I get to hear about how other people say it, right? And the, even that, those yes. conversations are very important. Let's check in with the chat room like uh, really quick. Justin says, yeah, uh, it feels essential to build a network of good people around us to be with and discuss. So important for solo operator businesses in particular. Support your a little bit. By the way, Catherine likes your top five, Brent, by the way. Um, Teresa says, uh, so many industries require continuing education. It makes sense for coaches to continue learning. And you mentioned a bunch of different ways to do that. In a second, I'm going to ask you about one in particular. Catherine says, since May 2020, I've completed 10 different programs. I'm applying for my ACC next week and finishing my master's thesis this, sem this semester. So Catherine, congratulations on that. She also says, I love reciprocal coaching sessions. Uh, I lead with strategic thinking and influencing, and they lead with relationship building. And so the kind of that kind of, again, those, those opposites, they kind of challenge you. And I'm, that is an area I could do, um, you know, I could do a lot better in is continuing to find those folks that are my opposite. Brent, how important, when we think about this continuing education and learning, how important is ICF? That has been, uh, 
you know, that has been an organization that has really landed hard on the Gallup certified coaching communities radar mm -hmm. over the last, I want to say five years. And I get a lot of questions around this. Can you talk from your own personal experience, kind of the importance of ICF and where do they fit into our ecosystem? One of the things that Gallup is, is so good at and, and Donald Clifton, the inventor of Clifton Strengths, is the pursuit of excellence. And, you know, even though Maximizer is number 34 for me, OK, my competition and focus has certain areas I want to be the best in that I believe I can be the best in. What is that one thing that you can be better than 10,000 people, as Donald Clifton said, and soar with your strengths? And so for me, professional coaching is one of those things. And so that means, Brent, if you want to be excellent, world class, you have consistent, near perfect performance in the coaching activity, then what will you do to get there? And so the International Coaching Federation is the gold standard of professional coaching. It's not the only standard, but it's the gold standard. Just like Gallup is the gold standard for the science of strengths. Uh, ICF is the gold standard for professional coaching. And so putting myself through that process, uh, as many of you know, is very rigorous. <clears throat> and, you know, I was at that, excuse me, <clears throat> I was no. at that PCC professional Christian coaching level for uh, two and a half, three years. And I knew I wanted to go after the master certified coach, the, the top level. And man, you're talking about having to be intentional. I mean, I created a, a, a goal sheet where I was aiming my strengths into the core competencies. I was taking ICF accredited courses. I had a professional MCC mentor coach. I was investing money. I was investing time. I was recording all of these coaching calls and then going back and watching game film uh, and watching that game film and learning, oh man, I needed to uh, take my knowledge, skills, and practice to the next level. And then last year, you know, I finally was able to get totally approved as a master certified coach, which was a dream come true. Oh, well, congratulations on that. It is a lot of work. I mean, it is a lot tracking and in and working. I, listen, I love the concept of game film. This is one of those areas I identify with most because as a podcaster, as a communicator, uh, this is all I do. And so I have to go back and um, I go, I go, I don't have to, but I do go back and listen to things that I've done in the past and it's painful at times. And I'm like, oh, I could have done that better. I also speak like as an example, I find myself, I speak slower than I think I do. Mm -hmm. And some people say I talk fast, but when I'm listening to it, it feels slow. <laughs> and, but, but I spend time reviewing things I've done. It's a perfect scenario because everything I do is recorded. When you think about game film and you talk about the way coaches can improve by watching, and I'm using air quotes, watching game film, what do you mean by that? I mean, what are some tangible ways they can get better by reviewing what they've done. Yeah. So, you know, when you get permission and you record your coaching session, I would actually score myself on, uh, it, it was the 11 core competencies. Now it's the eight core competencies. I would score myself on a scale of one to five by being the best. And my mentor coach would score me as well. Then we would come together and we would compare our scores and we would begin to fine tune. So, you know, for example, how good was our my coaching sessions in setting up the coaching agreement? I think that's one of the hardest things for a lot of coaches, especially when you have a very talkative client and they're giving you like, you know, 10 different areas that they want to talk about or explore. 
So how do you help them to start to focus and start to choose one or two areas that they want to explore inside the coaching session? And many coaches get overwhelmed or they, they try to set the agenda themselves or they don't also get markers of progress in the beginning of the coaching session. Like, how will you know? that you made progress by the end of this session on this particular topic. Those are just a part of those excellences about coaching that you don't know unless you go through a, a program like ICF. Yeah, I think ICF sets a nice framework for that. It sets a nice framework for learning. It's not, listen, the, the, the I get a lot of this feedback from some of our coaches it's a definitely um, a brand, a style of coaching that some people like and some people don't. But I, I think ICF sets a nice kind of a level, sets a nice learning path for you. If you use it just for their learning path, I think that's some great. You're, this idea of reviewing, I think, I think some coaches think they can come to a coaching session and it's all, it's kind of, you know, it's just a conversation and it is, but there's also learning moments that you can, there's you can science get, behind it. Yeah, you can get there's better at science that behind those coaching sessions. Talk talk a little bit more about that. When you say science, what do you mean by that? Well, and, and first of all, I, I guess there is a metaphor that's coming up in my mind. I, I'm not even a musician, but you know, think of ICF and learning the competencies like learning the chords in music. Mm-hmm. You you have to understand that there uh, is a range of different kinds of chords and sounds or maybe, maybe it's bars. You're, you're supposed to understand the bars first, but once you start learning those individual notes, then you can start to create your own jazz. You start taking up and you, you're riffing with your own individual uh, strengths and weaknesses as a coach and with your client, you're dancing, you're jazzing, you know, with your, your coaching client. But most Oh, I won't say most, many coaches want to start jazzing, <laughs> but they don't even know the, the bars, you know, before they, they start jazzing. And so they feel a little constricted by the ICF. I'm a tennis player. So learning the different grips for forehand, backhand volleys, you know, in the beginning, these were basics that I had to learn. And then as you know, a more sophisticated tennis player, I can change my grips if I need to, to put a different spin or, you know, to play a different kind of player than I'm playing. So, and same thing with strengths, right? You you know, you want to learn the, the 34 Clifton strengths themes uh, from the Gallup research and definition first, And then as you get to know them and you're applying them and you're experiencing uh, different types of clients with a variety of strengths, you start jazzing, you start seeing possibilities. None of us knew were there. And that's the the power and beauty. You got to learn the basics and then you got to keep growing in practice and excellence. And then I like to say, you know what? As an MCC, I still don't know it all about coaching. I'm still going to continue to learn and grow. And I, I keep, and, and I have this mindset about strengths as well, that I'm going to relearn everything I thought I knew about strengths, everything I thought I knew about coaching. I'm going to keep relearning it with new eyes. Mm. Catherine's got a good uh, point. Just to, to, to uh, build on yours, she says, as a former jazz singer, I had to learn the different types of scales and modes, right? Once you know the scale or the key the song is in, you just improvise around the scale, right? Great. I love that idea. So having to know it, uh, you know, you got to kind of know where you're going. You and I, in pre-show, we were talking about how do we want to structure this this chat? And, you, uh, and, and I was kind of mentioning to you, I like to make it look like it's a natural conversation, but I like to have structure so I know where we're going, right? Mm -hmm. And it's that same kind of idea. As you think about the Gallup tools that you use, the the things we provide for you in your coaching, what do you find is most helpful to you? What do you really like? What's your your go-to? And everybody's different in their coaching, but kind of what's your go-to? What do you get the most out of 
when we think about Clifton Strengths coaching? Man, I, of course, I'm a, I'm a fan of Gallup and so much appreciate my relationship with Gallup. If, if I was just to everything, almost everything Gallup puts out, I'm going to read or watch. It's kind of like one of those foundations that I'm just going to continue to, to dive into. But here's what I do a little differently. Then I start, and this is my individualization strength. I start individualizing, like, what if I apply strengths with self-compassion? What does that look like? What happens when I start applying strengths with conflict resolution? What does that look like? That's the jazz. That's the improvising. And, you know, one little way that I do this is, is even uh, this right here. Uh, taking the, the basics of the four domains of leadership that obviously uh, Gallup came up with. But then I, I have my own fun story and way that I share that information so that's where that thought leader comes into, you know, whether, you know, for me, it's strengthspreneur. Uh, I have my own registered trademark in that particular area, uh, writing a book on that, you know, strengths champion solutions is the name of my company. And so, you know, how do I brand off of that strengths champion versus something else? And I think each coach, you have that inner wisdom and experience. Sometimes you just don't even see it in yourself. Mm. And that's where you need the, the coaching and the mastermind to help you see it. George had asked a question a little bit earlier since you mentioned that. Let me bring it back. Any advice on joining a mastermind? Like if, you know, say I'm living out there and I don't have a lot of connections and I'm really looking to connect with people. Brent, how, how do folks go about starting? And I've got some ideas too, but how do folks mm -hmm. go about starting or becoming a part of a mastermind? Um, this is a little harder to find is mastermind. Uh, it's kind of like finding a coach, but again, I, I go for credibility. And if you go Google out there and you look up, you know, mastermind, business mastermind, marketing mastermind, uh, strengths-based mastermind, there's all different types of masterminds and you may be at a different season in your uh, development. Maybe you want to just learn more about each other's strengths and, or maybe you've already gotten a good foundation of strengths, but now it's like, okay, how do I champion strengths? Uh, let me give you one quick example. Like I have one mastermind that's I have two different masterminds. Uh, one's called a strengths champion mastermind. And in this particular mastermind, there are people who have a, a foundational knowledge of strengths, but they don't know how to apply strengths into an organization setting or uh, coaching managers or in applying it in different parts of their business. And so it could be HR people in there. It could be independent, independent coaches in there. So it's more about the application of strengths. It's not just knowing the themes. And another example of that is uh, my strengthspreneur mastermind. Again, it's not just knowing your strengths. It's like, okay, how do I apply my strengths in marketing? How do I apply my strengths in my branding? How do I apply my strengths in uh, hiring my, my own team and finding complementary partners that are uh, in my team. So it's, it's the application mm -hmm. of, of those strengths is what's important, I think, in the next stage of development. Yeah, I think finding that mastermind group is sometimes as much work as starting a business. Yes. <laughs> because, yes. right, I mean, this is it. You need to find folks that you're compatible with that you can get together with on a regular basis to create those reciprocal coaching relationships or to offer that advice. It requires, I think, meeting together on a fairly regular basis. I have a bunch of my coaching friends. There's a kind of a West Coast mastermind. They get together all the time. I hear from them and they're going through training together or they're doing things together. They've, they're have they like-minded in that sense and they, they go through I'm sure that mastermind took a while to put together. I don't know, Brent, if there's a magic formula for it or even a standard definition that 
you, you know, has these, Hey, every mastermind has this, this, that it's a, it's a group of people and size can be whatever works. I, I guess that's the key sometimes is thinking what's working. Like, is this group, whether it's three or five or 15, uh, is it working? I've seen some meet monthly, some meet quarterly. I know some groups that meet on an annual basis. They meet for a whole day once a year mm-hmm. type deal. Everybody brings a presentation and then they kind of talk about it. So I guess I want to tell our certified coaches, don't be intimidated by that concept of mastermind. Mm-hmm. Also, don't make it harder than it is. Mm-hmm. It's really just a group of people getting together spending time together, sharpening their, you know, sharpening the instruments of what they use in coaching. Brent, would you add anything to that? Yeah, there are different types of mastermind and, you know, some masterminds might even have uh, certain topics that you have some content you read or you study before you come to the mastermind and then you discuss those topics In some masterminds like my own, I do a lot of hot seat coaching. And so people get like 15 minutes and they literally present a business topic and their challenge. And they're asking the group a very specific question. And so that group will then do some quick asking questions for clarification. And then there's a brainstorming where literally you come up with as many solutions to that particular topic. And that person that's on the hot seat, they will then verbalize towards the end of that 15 minutes. Okay, here's the three things, you know, the ideas that I came up out of this and that I'm going to act on before the next mastermind. And for me, I really like, um, I've been a part of one mastermind where we met once a month for a full day. And I've had another mastermind where we met every other week for like an hour and a half. And that's, that's the format of mine. That way you're getting like three hours. Uh, and sometimes, you know what, it's kind of like coaching. You don't know what I want to talk about. Uh, I, I don't really know what's the best you know, area I need to delve into. And you come to that coaching session or you come to that mastermind, like you're not sure, but you know what? If you show up many times, you will have the biggest breakthroughs because you just come to a place of not knowing. And sometimes the not knowing all of a sudden produces a lot of creative uh, ideas and breakthroughs. Ralph makes a good comment. He says, he'd love to be part of a mastermind and just be on the path together. And, and, you know, in, in his case needs to be online, I think uh, Ralph, and this is a perfect example. I think a lot of folks want to be one in one. So make one, like start your own. You, Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you're the master by the way. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, you're not setting it up that way. Your goal is to gather, gather a few folks who you think would be interesting to include in this, ask them if they want to be a part of whatever frequency, whatever you're going to do. I guess don't overthink it and then just start meeting together. The, Mm -hmm. the mastermind concept, you know, you don't need permission. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to file any forms with the government, just do it. (laughs) Right. Just kind of get out there. I have a, I have a unique version of a mastermind where I wanted to learn. I wanted to continue to work on my craft of podcasting. And so kind of by accident, I just started another podcast about being better at podcasting with another podcaster. And Mm -hmm. we meet every Saturday. And we, the two of us get on and we talk about it. I'm a, I have communication for, so I like to think by talking. It mm-hmm. works perfect. And mm-hmm. it's weekly, right? Every single week we take audience feedback. We get other people to come on the show. We talk about it. Brent, it's, I think it can be that simple. And I, yes. I would, I don't call it my mastermind, but it, it is a form of a mastermind, mm-hmm. right? You can be super creative with it. I guess don't be intimidated. And if, if you want to do one, just gather some people and start one, right? Get some friends together. That's how I started my very first mastermind uh, in my home uh, many years ago. And I remember I was learning it from my hero, Jack Canfield, about Mm. starting a mastermind. And so I I went to like three or four different uh, entrepreneurs in my community. And three of us had just written our very first book. And so... It was us three and one other spa owner. And that particular mastermind 
continued 10 straight years where we met twice a month. Yeah. Now we had different people come in and out. So you're going to see, uh, you know, some change. That one was in person. Um, and like Ralph said a few moments ago, the cool thing now is we can do masterminding with people all around the world because yeah. we can be on Zoom or whatever platform you use. So, but it is powerful when you can have the online and then maybe once a year uh, or twice a year, you, you come together in person. There is some synergy and creativity that uh, I found comes from that as well. Yeah. I like it. Ralph, Ralph says some, someone would need to be the master. I would contribute to the mind part. So that's a good Ralph. That's a good way. And, um, and that's one other quick thing yeah. is understand that a mastermind is about uh, facilitating uh, growth. It's not about anyone being the expert. Yeah. We all are experts in the group. No one's above each other. We have this openness to learn, respect and grow uh, from each other. So don't put yeah. that pressure on yourself to be the master. I wish somebody, if I've been racking my brain how to get the word service or serving in that concept of a mastermind, Ser mm -hmm. serving mind doesn't work mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. but there are really groups about serving each other. That's really the, the concept in it is not to be the teacher. Teaching and learning will happen in the context of it, but I think the best ones work when the group members are serving each other in mm -hmm. that way and yes. and are giving, right? I mean, I think that's, it's more of a giving mind. Again, that'll come to me. Somebody will come up with a great. Yeah. Uh, they come up that. with a new name. Brandon, the next 15 in the last 15 minutes or so a uh, segment of this, I'm going to ask you some, and we're going to kind of talk about the business of being a solopreneur. And I really kind of want to open this up to the chat room for your questions as well. This would be a great opportunity for you to ask kind of some specific questions. We won't be able to spend it a, uh, gigantic amount of time in any one, but we will. So if you're in chat, you want to ask some questions, do that. As we think about Brent pursuing entrepreneurial excellence and the, the, with the emphasis on entrepreneurial, because as a coach, many coaches are coming at this. Many who are listening to this are embedded in organizations. And, uh, you know, I almost said they don't need to be entrepreneurial, but they do because they're doing entrepreneurial work inside their mm -hmm. organizations. I just had a phone call yesterday with someone who's starting up a big strengths practice inside a big organization. Mm -hmm. Guess what? That's, you know, call that intrapreneurial or call it, it doesn't matter. They're starting a small business inside an organization. So mm -hmm. we all do that. If you were to think about some concepts or some principles or some encouragement to folks who are in this, they, you always feel alone. You always feel like I'm, this is a bigger mountain than I can climb. Uh, g give some of those, give some encouragement. What are some things you would say to those individuals? Yeah, use that desire and learner and input and strategic uh, to help you learn the business of business. Mm. Uh, I didn't even know I was an entrepreneur until I started my own business. And then I, I remember listening to a cassette tape <laughs> on uh, building my business. That's how long ago it was. Yeah. See, you're laughing. I know. See, I'm, I'm a dinosaur. I was there too. No, I used to get those too, Brad. I used to get those too. <laughs> but I remember that was the first thing that I listened to. Uh, Terrence Gorski was his name. And he was teaching about how to start your own counseling business and setting up your forms and setting up your practice. And from there, it was like listening to uh, other books and reading other books and then I started attending workshops and different things, you know, so like entrepreneurial operating system, uh, scaling up. These are, are, are two really good business building uh, programs that the more that you can study and learn, then you're going to you're going to learn the elements of growing a, a business and not just a hobby. Hmm. What kind of encouragement? We don't celebrate the entrepreneurs enough, the folks inside organizations mm. there who are wanting to build a strengths practice. They're, they're, they're trying to drive an organization to be a strengths-based organization. They're bringing in strengths as a part of that. In your coaching experience and, and working with coaches that are in that role, what kind of encouragement would you give to them? What would you say to them? You know, what would you say to this person that I had a conversation with yesterday who's 
saying, we don't have strengths at all, but we want to, and I want to be the one in our organization to do it. What kind of encouragement would you give them? Yes. Entrepreneur is what I would definitely call those that are entrepreneurial inside of a larger organization. I see you as that for Gallup. You are influencing. You are helping the brand to become uh, more known and you're, you're helping to share the products and the services. And so, you know, people can do that either through podcasts or even through their, their social media, their online. And then there are some people in organizations, they just they have no idea even uh, how to do that. And so like I, I spoke to a, a group of insurance agents this past uh, summer. And one of the guys who, who heard me, he said, Brent, I want to order your book and I want to have you come in to help my team be more entrepreneurial. So, so in other words, he was saying, Brent, I want even my, my admin assistant. I want my, uh, not just my salespeople. I, I want everyone in my organization to take ownership for growing the business. And that's really what entrepreneurs are. They take ownership to grow and to scale a product and a service. And so uh, that's what organizations do. If you don't have someone inside the organization helping you to sell it and to share it and influence it, then that organization is going to stagnate eventually. Mm -hmm. You, we started this with the idea of the long game and in the pre-call, you asked the question, you know, how long have we been doing this? And the very first certification class, I think, went through in 2012. So we're at, mm. we're coming up, I think that's May of 2012. So we're coming up on 10 years. Uh, we started, I think, I, and, and I think we started the podcast not far, not long after that or around that same time period. So we're at 10 years or nine years, somewhere in there for those. I just feel like we're finally hitting some strides. <laughs> you know, after 10 years, I'm like, oh, we're learning a few things and we continue to make mistakes and we continue, you know, those kinds of things. But in, I think for a lot of coaches setting this up, both for in, in intrapreneurs and for entrepreneurs, and I don't want to discourage anybody, but I, I do think it's a long game approach with a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of games in between, right? There's a whole bunch of things yeah. you need to win, right? Kind of in between. What do you think is for, for most, for most intra or entrepreneurs, when you think about the number one thing they struggle with the most, and you may have mentioned this already, but what do you think, what do you think that is? What do you see most common in entrepreneurs that they really struggle with? Number one that I've seen is that we have a, a definition or a concept in our head, for example, about marketing or sales that we have a disconnect with. We don't like it. I'm not a marketer or I'm not a salesperson. And therefore, if you're going to grow a business, you have to market and you have to sell. There, that is just the bottom line. It's kind of like if you want to be have a long term marriage, you do have to communicate and you do have to have some affection and love and connection, right? <laughs> you're not going to stay together if you don't have it. Well, you're not going to have a business unless you market and sell. And so, but here's the key. And the key is that all of us Clifton Strengths coaches have it. Gallup's helped us. And that is find those activities in business building that match your strengths. Build marketing and sales around your strengths. If belief, for example, is one of your strong talents, maybe your belief is marketing is just serving. Mm -hmm. So when I serve others with my values, then I'm adding value to the world. And so most people, though, are not connecting their strengths to business building. And so that is the, the whole resilience game. And then I would say the second piece is those areas that do not connect with you and you, you don't have a passion, you don't care about, maybe it's product development or disrupting by creating a new service or a new product. 
then barter or hire other complementary partners who love doing those things. Um, I have one of my team members who has Maximizer in her top five. It's number 34 for me. And she is great at content creation. So our Strengths Champion Academy online courses is just starting to knock it out of the park. Uh, but partly because of her, it's not just me. Uh, but I just realized I have a need. I have a weakness and I need her as a complimentary partner. I love that idea, Brent, of complimentary, complimentary partners. I was reviewing uh, my own website's SEO the other day, and I have one post that is just far and above crushing it, and I didn't write it. <laughs> and uh, so I was, talking to my, <laughs> I was talking to my daughter about it, and she's like, well, Dad, that's because they optimized it for SEO, and you're not very good at that. And, you know, it was that moment I was like, yeah, I, I don't, I should never be trusted to do the writing for things. In, in at Gallup, I have a writer, Mark, who many of you have heard me reference before. Mark does a lot of that editing and writing for me, and he's fantastic at it. And I am more than welcome, I'm more than happy to turn that work. In fact, it, it gives me great joy to see his art uh, yeah. play out right in that way. And so um, I love that, that you brought that in to say, you know, I, and I, we say beg, borrow, and steal. Uh, that's maybe not the best way to say it, but I like how you said barter, right? <laughs> Work with another individual who's different than you, who enjoys some of those business practices that are different. George's asking a question about uh, the book. Who did you first contact if you're thinking? And by the way, the end goal for, I, I sometimes think coaches think this, the end goal for every coach is not to write a book. It's helpful if that's what you, I'm never going to write a book. I just don't have that in me. I'm not going to do it. Doesn't mean I'm not going to be successful in what I do, but Brent, for you. So I'm giving you permission. You don't have to have one. But if you're going to write one, what what's your advice on on book writing? What would you give to somebody who's thinking about putting a book together? So here's here's the cool thing. I've written seven books, and I don't like writing. <laughs> so how'd I do it? Seven different ways. And the first book uh, was a self-published book. And that was the one I wrote everything in that book. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's, it's being updated right now. It's called Balance Matters. So to the person who asked about publishing, you know, you can go the self-publishing route. So that means you really are just creating your own publishing company. You're getting your uh, barcodes you're uh, setting everything up. Now, there are a couple of different uh, companies that can help you do it faster. You know, for example, 48hrbooks.com, 48hrbooks.com is a company I've used over the years. And they'll help you get everything set up, formatted, and you can do soft cover, hardcover books, uh, print on demand books, so you don't have to store all your books. And you can also go through Amazon. Amazon now is not only doing Kindle books, but also soft cover and hardcover books now. And so again, you don't have to store. So the self-publishing route is definitely faster and you, you remain more control and you can make more money off of your books that way. And you become a thought leader. So I, I actually say one way you differentiate is by writing a book, which doesn't have to be 200 plus pages. It could be a 30 to 60 page book. Uh, my selling strengths is only like uh, 60 pages and it became my Amazon number one bestseller, right? So my favorite way, and Jim, this might be something that could be helpful for you because we both have communication in our top 10, is I like to teach and record, then have it transcribed and then hire my team to help me do all the editing, all the formatting and create the book. It's the easiest way to create a book. Yeah. I've been given that advice many times, Brent, like, Hey, just record. And, and it, it, maybe in the future I'll have Mark, I'll do that. I'll do this. And then I'll have Mark. Cause he's just my favorite. You have Mark more. already. I mean, Go you through. Gotta well, learn just, yeah, it's a little harder to do that. A little extra though. As while I'm working for Gal, that's a little more <laughs> difficult because they write different kinds of books. And, uh, and, and so, well, it's some, that's Brent, that's some great advice on the, uh, on the book side. When we think about other areas of influence, so you mentioned books, what other areas, because 
for some folks, maybe that's not, they're not going to go that route. What are some other things they can do to be an influencer or to be a thought leader, so to speak? So, so one of the areas that I think coaches can differentiate is through their own products and services. Uh, some of you are really good about being innovative and disrupting. And so you can uh, create your own course. And that's my first thing is, you know, create a course on it. It, it, it can start off like maybe just three one hour sessions. And now you've developed content and a little workbook and you, you do videos and you can sell that course online as well as you can go present on it live so you can repurpose that into white papers to give away so that you're capturing more email addresses on your website so there are so many ways to repurpose content uh, just like gallup does you, you all ha are so good at modeling this for us as coaches is create the content repurpose it many different ways and that way it's marketing and sales, as well as you're adding value to other people at the same time. Newsletters are another one of those. You mentioned a, a, you know, a mailing list, having a mailing list and sending out a regular newsletter uh, to folks. Mm -hmm. This is an area we've just mentioned about four or five different communication skills that some mm -hmm. are better at than others. Yes. And so I think just a great, a great opportunity to kind of find your niche I think one of the things I've learned, Brent, in this, in, and I think it's a lesson learned least by individuals, is when they start doing these, these exercises, they gather a few people and they feel like they have to have thousands. And, mm. and I actually think there's a sweet spot in the very beginning where you have tens and you can be spending a lot of time with those tens. Like you can be doing a lot of market research. You can be asking a lot of questions. They're obviously staying around you because they're interested in you. Spend time with them. Do your market research with them. Use them. You have access to them. And obviously they're the most engaged customers you have at the moment because <laughs> they've signed up for your newsletter or they've done something like that. I think sometimes we spend so much time trying to reach the masses. Mm. We forget about those individuals mm. who are, mm. you know, I think about the folks that are in our chat room right now. And I think I know most of them and I have, regular conversations with quite a few of them. And so it's spending time with them. It's important to me. They're willing to give me feedback. And I think yes. lots of entrepreneurs get so busy in the business of scale. They don't forget you don't need to scale until you need to scale. Spend time, maybe spend extra time with folks uh, who are close to you and don't miss them because they're, they're, they're going to probably be your most engaged audience forever or your most engaged customers forever. Don't forget about them. And that's actually one of the 10 areas of business development that uh, I discuss, and that is client engagement. Mm. So how, what kind of system do you have in your coaching business to engage someone, not only through that first 100 days, which by the way, the research shows that when you have a, a client that is totally emotionally engaged with you in the first 100 days, the likelihood of that client rehiring you ongoing goes up like 10% uh, or 10 times, I should say. So, so in other words, having a system, and I will say this ha has not been one of my strengths because I'm probably a little more natural at marketing and getting new clients, uh, a little more of a rainmaker in that sense. But I, I've also hired a team who is helping me to implement a consistent plan, not only for blogging and engaging my ongoing clients, but also sending gifts and uh, sending different ways, uh, surprising my clients along the way so that I'm building that more long-term engagement mm -hmm. uh, with those clients. Brent, a lot of great advice. Uh, I think the advice I'd give to anybody listening now is go back to the beginning and listen to it again. Cause I think there's and not for me, but cause there's a lot of great advice in there that Brent gives uh, on, on all these pre on all these pieces. Brent, thanks for coming back uh, today. Thanks for the representation that you give to the Clifton strengths community uh, around the world, the care and the love and the passion that you give to your customers and to your clients and to those that you coach. 
and just being kind of being a force uh, for it out there. I see you everywhere. So thanks for the, the, the for, may the, the force work. be with you. <laughs> That's we can't say that <laughs> Disney now will now have us taken down for saying <laughs> that, but, but, uh, but all well intended Brent uh, hang tight for me one second with that. We'll remind everyone to take full advantage of all the resources we do have available now in Gallup access, head out to gallup.com slash Clifton strengths, sign in for coaching, master coaching, or to become a Gallup certified strengths coach. What we we're talking about here you want to start that journey, you're listening to this and you want to start that journey, send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. We can get you set up to get that process going. Um, you, we're, I'm kind of starting a series. I didn't even think about this till today, but I've got a couple guests coming up as we think about kind of master coaching or coaches have been doing this a long time. Maureen Monty is joining me in a couple weeks here. And of course, she's written a fantastic book and has lots yes. of advice. Head out to gallup.eventbrite.com. Get signed up for that if it's still time or Head over to the gallup.com slash Clifton Strengths and listen to the podcast we've already already recorded. But we'll be spending some time here the, this early this year talking about that. Again, that address, gallup.eventbrite. Follow us so you get notifications whenever we post something new and uh, get registered for that event in, or, or the other events that are available. Like we do a couple of weeks, so we'd love to see you out there. We want to thank you for joining us today. Brent, can you stay around for a few, just a few minutes uh, after sure. the show? Do you got to If you're mm -hmm. in the live uh, and you didn't get your question asked, uh, stay around. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.